interesting. I, I am your host, Joshua Pentelaresco. I write stuff in podcasts too. Today, Thielen, I always get your Bjerg. Bjerg? Yeah, it's the it's the Scandinavian J, so it makes the yes sound. So it's Bjerg. Yeah. Bjerg. Okay, yeah. It's why it, it's it, it yeah, because J's, oh man. I did an audio book thing last year. It was uh it, it was Esperanto, the J. Every time, I, like, I know nothing about Esperanto. What is what is an Esperanto? Oh, so they, 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 there's either a ya or a you, right? Depending on depending on it, and it's just like and and it's not, and sometimes it's the same damn word. So it's like, I hope I got this right. Ironically, the Mandarin was easy, <laughs> right? But it was like, hmm. but How do, 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 because they give you a phonetic as a well, as no, a. Well, I, no, actually, the reason why the Mandarin was so easy for me was because I used to play a game called Dynasty Warriors, so I got to, I got very familiar with how the Mandarin was pronounced playing the video game. So uh. it's just like, yeah. So you see all these names with with the X's in front. It's like, how the hell do you say that? It's a Z sound. It's like, oh, okay, Swali. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Or or, or Zuhong. Or it suddenly you, you you can you can figure it out like relatively quickly how to. Uh, how to do it and uh right so mandarin's easy like once you hear it once you actually kind of figure it like like the english translation to mandarin is actually not the hardest part about it it's the uh um obviously chinese characters the fact that there's tens of thousands of them it's a much harder language to learn how to read and spell yeah. although right but speaking it speaking it you can you can it's not the most it's not the hardest one to learn as it's, not, on it's not one of the ones where where pitch affects meanings where you have like words that english speakers think are homophones but because we're not used to accommodating for for pitch i know that some asian languages have that i'm not familiar enough to know if mandarin i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure it does but pitch is not necessarily i kind of feel like, like for me pitch is more like it, it's almost I'm not gonna say the slang exactly, but it's just it's a cultural thing in the in in how they say things and do things, right? And so that's not that's not the terrible part there. Sounding it out is not hard. Like the, the little things are what get you there. But when you don't, when you have like a J in in a, in a dead language, and you're like, oh god, how the hell do you say that? <laughs> right? It's like, uh, I did it. I went, I went to the guy. I hope you like this. <laughs> right, because <laughs> right, I don't fucking know. Right, so but uh, that that's pretty much it. So how you doing, man? Welcome to the show. You're officially part of the show. Stoked to be here. Yeah, I'm doing good. Yeah, got my new glasses. This is this that. is 38. I got reading glasses, computer glasses. Feeling good. Nice to not there have are. eye strain looking at the monitor. I, I've been very fortunate. I got none of those problems yet, and I'm older than you. Yes. Oh my problem. Enjoy. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I'm enjoying it all, man. Every little bit. Cause you know, I realized too, I mean, I'm gonna get older and I'm gonna need more shit too. Maybe I'll have glasses, you know, maybe my hair will all fall out. I don't know. I mean, I mean getting older is just part of life and so you just gotta go and uh kind of accept what accept the hand that fate gives you, you know? So like, Yeah, I can't complain. Good. Yeah. Little little reading glass action's not a problem. No, it's not. It's totally not. Like it's one of those things where, uh, yeah, no, it's kind of cool to see. Um, hmm. But we talk about like we geek out all the time. So, if, and anyone that's watching, listening, um, Lima and I tend to write together usually for like an hour or two on the weekend. So half the time, sometimes we get right to it. And if Rachel's there, it's great. It's a lot easier to get right to it. We don't we don't go into big deep discussions. <laughs> Every once in a while, we'll just go off into a tangent, like. You're like, 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 uh, last time we talked about Last Jedi, which is just like, we yeah. went for like, yeah, we went for like 30 minutes on Last Jedi, which is, I think, pretty funny. So it's just like, but, uh, yeah. So how's it been? Like, have I been a good right club? Don't talk about right club. Uh, I guess moderator, I guess for lack of a better term. Yeah, man. No, I, yeah. uh, I need that. I need, uh, a certain amount of like positive peer pressure. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's important for me. If I have regular engagements, I don't want to show up with nothing to work on, you know, or nothing completed. So anytime I'm given an opportunity to 
join a writing group where you have to show up and share or show up and write, I say yes because it just it works on me every time. Yes, and it's, you, you get shit done. You get shit yeah. done. So your writing medium of choice is comics, right? Yeah. So why comics? Not say pros. Um. Well, I don't. I, I don't. If if given the option. I wouldn't choose between the two. Um, but I like I like storytelling, and I think that visual mediums do that more efficiently. Um, I feel like that's the like the absolute fastest way I can consume a story is through a comic. And the fastest way I can tell someone a story is through a comic. Um, so I, I love the written word, and I certainly... You know, don't read comics exclusively. I read lots of novels and pro stuff, but uh, oh, yeah, comics are yeah. are story crack. They're the they're the they're the hard stuff. It's fully refined. Well, I I always think like I I enjoy visual mediums myself. I actually enjoy it when it actually merges with pros. I actually like I I I like my pros to be like somewhat meaty, right? Um. But uh, it's one of those. It's one of those things where uh, I, I find like everybody has a different thing. But for me, it's like words and pictures are just meant to go together. They just totally are meant to go together. They're totally meant to like uh, be part of the. Uh, they're part. They're meant to be part of the show. They're meant to be like, hey, listen, I'm going to. I'm going to work together because I'm peanut butter and you're jelly, and we're meant to be. I, I think one of the yeah. weirdest things. I, I think one of the cool things about today is like 20 years ago, people would have said, you read comic books, <laughs> superhero, you, you still read superheroes. Now it's like, no, oh, cool. So what do you read? And yeah. then, yeah, right. Very it's actually, mainstream. Like, yeah, they are mainstream now. They are a big part of, uh, they are an acceptable part of popular culture, quote unquote. Although the superheroes still dominate the heck out of this. Um, but it's it's a, it's becoming a more diverse thing, which I think is really good. Yeah, yeah. Image is image is big, right? Yeah. Third biggest comic publisher, and they pretty much don't do shows. Yeah. Then there's like Boom. I think I think my favorite yeah. like, publisher right now is probably Boom. Probably. Oh, nice. I think. They, yeah, they uh, they're what Image like so when, back when Image was doing like their their um how do I put this their dynastic like their their uh, when Sega came out and they just had one hit book after another after another after another that's Boom right now Boom has a lot of these oh, cool yeah. little stories cool little stories that are really really good and sound and solid and um they're the ones where it's like okay this is the hot place Image still does great books. I think um, an underrated gem right now is Crossover by, uh, man, I can't remember his name, Donny Cates. Donny Cates' Crossover is actually oh, kind yeah. of fun. It's cool, I'm going to check that one out. Yeah. I need to, I'm a entrenched uh, image reader, so you're going to have to put me what on do you, some what you, what, 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 what do you read? What do you, what do you read for image? Like, what's your, what's your coolest? Um, well, like many people, I'm waiting for Saga to start back up. Uh, pretty much anything Jeff Lemire puts out, I read. I've been enjoying Farmhand by Rob Guillory. Uh, the Weatherman is really good. Um, um, the Gideon Falls, I've been, uh, I've been enjoying Gideon Falls. Uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of... Home There's a few Pilot titles for you. Book right now. That's my image book. Right oh, now. I'm so excited! I love that. I love that. Uh, that team. Um, have you read uh, Limbo? No, I have not. That's the same. That's the same guys. And yeah, I'm. I'm as soon as the first trade comes out. I think it's coming out. Like yeah, right it, about it, now. It, it's out literally. Like I think this week or oh, next week. So sweet. Yeah. Sweet. Like yeah. Cool. No, I'm grabbing it. I have this. I have all the floppies. I still do floppies, but I, I only do a handful of floppies now. My other major, like, um, my other major, like, uh, habit of choice right now is the secret publisher of comics that's really, really big right now, which is Kickstarter. Yes. Yes. Yeah, huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the secret publisher of comics, ladies and gentlemen. Thing is, um, Image is, uh, how, do I, how do I put this? Not Image, Kickstarter has 
very quietly been a big proponent of the comic book industry for the last few years. But in the last year, if we were talking about boom, no pun intended, places for comics, it's Kickstarter right now. There's a lot of good books on there every single month. So yeah, well, a bunch of uh, a bunch of like established pros that are published on you know on big labels are doing kick like they did kickstarters in 2020 right like jeff lemire dave rubin and a third guy who i can't they did cosmic detective on kickstarter that was a huge kickstarter um ed brisson did uh did a murder book on kickstarter um like or a murder book sequel i should say but yeah it's i think that's i think that's interesting like yeah guys are just going oh i have a i have a fan base i can just go on kickstarter and make my book well it's good business because what it it does is like comics have had for the longest time a very monopolistic practice that isn't very healthy to the industry as a whole and kickstarter just cuts around cuts that out completely right Mm -hmm. and i think and i love the fact that um you can come up like you can build an audience just with your projects and i think that's a really really i think like for me i think as an author straight strictly like not even comics like, i think book wise there's a lot of untapped potential for for books and kickstarter that i feel that a lot of authors haven't figured this out yet and it's like like i look at someone like russell nolte okay i just like he's my last kickstarter for the foresee there's one exception um, but basically my Kickstarter privileges are revoked until my shit's out. Um, but Russell makes a killing with his books and his novels are, are a big part of his model on there and they do very well. Um, cool. I think, yeah, no, I, I just think, I just think strictly speaking, I, I think if we're talking strictly on a business level, I think as a creative, you gotta be looking at all these different potential revenue streams. And going to yourself, how can I reach these audiences? Because the audience, but what's happened is all these audiences have become very niche. There's still like people that go to the comic yeah. shop, still, that still go and order their traditional comics, and they're a great audience. Don't get me wrong, but that's one audience. Then there's another audience that, like I said, will support you, like on a Kickstarter, crowdfunding. And you can still do a more traditional indie publisher or Indiegogo is another big spot too. And people are getting legit contracts in the movies and publishing deals through Kickstarter through Indiegogo now. So if you're looking at, if you're looking at the future of art, like, uh, and then there's Patreon pages, there's other things like that too. Right. I think, I think as a creative person, you have to start looking at like building your audience just based on the fact that, um, you you have you have all these different audiences and not every audience is for you but you should need i think everybody every creative needs owes it to themselves to find those audiences wherever they are yeah yeah that's you have access to the world this is uh, this is something i'm bad at but you know it's like yeah i have access to the world so there i'm i can find a thousand people who like what i do yeah. If I, if you know, like, you, like you, if you work at it, you can do that. I don't think it'll work that hard. I think, so you have an advantage, I think, more than the, like, so, like, if I was doing it and I was trying to start a comic and you were trying to do a comic on Kickstarter, you have an advantage. And the reason I say that is because you've already proven that you can finish projects, right? And you mm-hmm. can actually use that as like in your rewards tier. Hey, right? I, you pay $5, I'll give you an ebook of all my cool shit that I've done before. Yeah, yeah, true. Right, right, right. And it's like my cool shit, this, all only, this will not only solidify me as a, um, this will not only solidify me as a viable option to invest in because I'm proving I shit done. Now you got to sample my stuff. I'm giving you a gateway drug. You'll come back for more. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And, and, and that's the thing. Like me, I have to start from the bottom. It's like, hey, here's my first project. Mom, dad, I heart you. <laughs> put five bucks into my Kickstarter. Please put something in there so it's not zero. Um, 
but I mean that that's it. Like I think I think like I said, we as creatives now have to become more the marketer, and we have to be comfortable in the fact of selling our stories and more importantly, selling ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean that, and that's there's there's an to me there's an interesting tension there because I feel like there's not a ton of overlap in no. in that in that the types of personalities that you know you're not. You're probably not a salesperson if you're if you're creative. Like it, it ha you know, it happens. It definitely there. There are people that have that. I think of like uh, Rob Liefeld. I feel like that's a guy who's who's both. He's a he's a creative and he's a salesman. Like you listen to that guy talk about comics, talk about his work. He gets you psyched up. Um, but well, it, it's it's not. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna disagree with you. I mean, this is usual. Yeah, yeah no, that, that's what I came here for. Just, just, just so we know, we have some excellent discussions sometimes of how the world works, and it's really interesting. Our perspectives are, are, are different there sometimes. Here's the thing. Okay, I, I look at marketing. Marketing is essentially it's the same thing as writing a story. It's storytelling. The only difference is is what kind of story are you telling. Right. Instead of telling this, creating this experience that people can hallucinate over and get some kind of empathy for us, which is what we do when we create a story. The idea is you. the goal is different. Instead of creating a relationship with those characters, those books, and those connections, now you're trying to do the same thing for you to your readers. Right? Uh, not, true. not, right, it's the same, it, it's the same tools. The result, the goal is different. That's all. Right? So, it's kind of like, okay, so Rob Liefeld being a salesman. Okay, Rob, if you listen to Rob talk when he's in sales mode, because there's a legitimate part of him that's super enthused in what he's doing, and you can feel it. It's real. That's yeah. the realest thing about Rob. Um, personal experiences with him, not a fan of him as a person. Just that's me. That's just, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 I've that's never him. met him. <laughs> yeah, um, I, 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 did, I did at a convention. I, I – uh, he, like I said, nine out of ten creatives I've met are incredibly sweet people. He was the one in ten for me, and uh, and it was um, it was like, but I will say this: when he's serious and he wants to talk and he's enthusiastic and, he, and he's he's excitable because he loves he loves what he does. Like you, you can like that's the legitimate thing about Rob is he loves what he does. Um, he doesn't always bring it out in the most in the best ways i don't think he comes always off in his absolute best but the passion's there and that's what people can and people can connect to that passion and that's yeah. why that's why he sells not everybody has is necessarily that kind of passionate dude but you don't necessarily have to be that guy either you can be chill you can be quiet you can be you know you can be funny you can be dry you can be you know, miserable. Some people are are, are, are hilarious when they're miserable. <laughs> like this, that yeah. is dark humor. That's really really funny, right? But the point is, right? Like when you when you look at it from that perspective, it's really about finding that authentic. Like, what gets you authentically excited, and what what do you obsess over? And if you can channel that obsession, obsession, like like learning how to do that. If you can learn how to do that, you can solve. Yeah, word. Yeah. No, it's no, I like I guess yeah, I don't I don't disagree, but I think it's that's the if. <laughs> that's the but, but, right? but, like, I, but, but I think it's a tool it's a skill that anyone can learn. It's just recognizing like it's just being aware of your goals, right? Right? Like when you're creating something, you, it's easy for you to get excited. You're in this headspace, you're discovering this new world, you're building it from the ground up, and we'll talk about story structure and stuff in a minute because I know that's that's what you're doing right now, right? And you get excited about that stuff because that it's fun. You're building, you're solving problems, you're you're, you're figuring out kind of where how the world works, what the world does, it's like cool shit yeah. like that, right? And you get excited about that, right? Yeah. You know what that feels like, so. The trick then is if you know it, like it's it's tapping into that, learning how to tap into that kind of like at will. If you can do that, right? And again, it's a skill. You have to work at it. That's the thing. Like you have to take the time to work at it. But if you can do that, 
right? You can learn the sub because it, again, it's not that different. Like storytelling wise, it's not that different. It's very yeah. much right. It's it's the, it's a similar skill set. So I actually I actually think I find it I find it in one sense ironic that writers are very shy when it comes to selling because it's almost the exact it's almost verbatim the exact same skill set they already have. Sorry, I got cord cord issues under the desk. No worries. <laughs> no, yeah, no worries. you're you're absolutely right. Um, I've always had this feeling of like, like I write stories. This is me getting doing a psychoanalyzing myself, but that I write stories so that I have these like avatars that I can send out into the world, and they can talk to people for me. Yeah, <laughs> and then it's like, oh no, I still have to talk to people. So to get them to read my stories. <laughs> like, God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> Why doesn't this work? Why doesn't this magically work? But I mean, but because I mean storytelling is the one art form where you're you're literally asking everybody for their time up front. Cool thing about comics is you can kind of get a sense of the stories about just looking at it. So it's a little easier as a comic. Yeah. Hey, yeah, I got this less, awesome book. Yeah, look at this cover. Do you yeah, want to open this book? Like they're, if they're, you're, if your cover's good, you're you know, you, you can, and yeah. You and the first people. if the if the first page is is showing you know it has pretty pictures, they're gonna give your story a chance. Uh, yeah. Like mu like music, right? Like you know, it, it's kind of the same. It, you, you, words are getting paired with something pretty, so the writer gets to lean on the pretty accompaniment. If you're writing just prose, then your words had better be pretty. My words are amazing. Like I need to say that. <laughs> words are amazing, right? So, but that all said, right? That all said, right? It, what what's happening and what's going on is you have to recognize the fact that um, that you're asking for that time up front. So, what you need to do, what you need to do, what needs to happen then is, if you realize that, you're gonna have you you have to kind of treat you have to treat the um, story the book all that stuff right um okay my problem is how can i get them to bite for five minutes like I'm, I'm simplifying this very much it's not always quite that easy but that's the thing like you have to have that confidence in yourself like you should have that confidence so if you put that much effort into writing your story i mean you sacrifice your time and your blood sweat and tears to do it you gotta believe in it on some level right God, or else why did you do it? Yeah, it and yeah, right. So your challenge is how can I get them to commit to five minutes? One way, it's not the only way, but one way, and this is what I've been kind of doing is um, okay, how can I get them to invest in me? Because if I can get them to invest in me, suddenly they'll find a product of mine to invest in. May not be all of them, but they'll find something. Yeah, I agree. I definitely have creator loyalty, probably above pretty much anything else. Like if mm -hmm. if I find someone who makes stuff I like, I check out everything they do. Mm -hmm. It's true of music too, right? I'm a lights fan. I don't de I don't deny it. I'm not a lights fan. So when she releases something, I check it out. I don't like everything she does. But I check everything out because I have faith in her as a creative person. She's earned that loyalty with just the fact that I just dig her music. Right? And we do that. We follow people. We obsess over people. We obsess over. And every once in a while, you get like this series that becomes like this gem. Like it could be The Wheel of Time. It could be, uh, you know, The Way of Kings uh, stuff with Brandon Sanderson. Or it could be, you know, Ilana Andrews, Kate Daniels World. It can be like. There's a lot of different iconic series out there. I mentioned fantasy, but I can also mention Diane Gab Gabalin series, two Outlander, it's her Outlander series is like that too. Mm -hmm. And you got Walking Dead with Rob Kirkman, you got Watchmen with Alan Moore, which we'll we'll have to touch on because you're 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 doing something really cool with that right now. But um, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, but so you got these iconic properties, but. At some at at some point, like at some point too, like I don't just think about Watchmen, I think about Alan Moore. 
to a lesser extent, Dave Gibbons. I think Gibbons gets a little undersold in Watchmen, to be perfectly honest with you. I, I Gibbons, totally agree. That yeah. Gibbons yeah. Gibbons is a huge part of that book being as excellent as it is. Yes. That book would not be as good without Gibbons. It just would not be. And we'll like I said, we'll come back to that. We'll wrap this point up and then we'll we'll go we'll go into Watchmen. I think that seems like that seems like the way to go here. Yeah, but but I, I just like I think as a creative, your goal should be business and create to begin just to keep that to make that living as a creative. Write the best book you can, first and foremost, whatever it is. Do the best book you possibly can. And then the second and second part though is be enthusiastic about it. Do you know like my favorite like stories about my favorite story about what creator is actually like Jeff Smith and Bone? Because in the old days when he started, he would like just be so enthusiastic about his work. He'd get people to try it just based on you're so into this. I cannot help but but want to want to true want to do it. Uh, yeah, I, I remember. I remember, I, and that enthusiasm works. One of my uh, ex girlfriends, she I remember before she was my girlfriend, she was working at this coffee shop, and she was so excited because she discovered how to make this minty fox. She was so like honestly, it's, it might be the happiest I've ever seen her. She was so enthused about the discovery of what she did. I couldn't say no. I just I just couldn't. I was just like. I have to order one now because <laughs> she's like you, that, that genuine feeling people respond to it. Right. I think, I think more than anything else, it's like, I think honestly with creatives, it's about recognizing that passion you have and just finding that constructive way to show it. Again, you don't have to be loud about it. Not everybody's loud and they shouldn't be. But you have to show it because if you show it, people will, will will give you a shot. Yeah, word. I agree. I agree. I think that's. I think that is the path. Particularly, particularly if you're somebody like me who's a bit nervous about selling yourself. Like, if you if you have this seed of genuine passion that you can grab onto, and nurture that and share. You know, that's because I think I think part of at least the anxiety I feel. And I wonder if it's what other people feel is certain about being disingenuous, right? right. Like, like, because you're selling something. I, you know, I, I like, but it's like if, if what you if you feel like what you're selling is real, then what's the problem? You're not being disingenuous. You're exposing people to something awesome. Well, yeah, but but uh, okay. So I guess I'll ask. Uh, this is the deep psychological armchair analyst. Then for the day here is this. Do you feel like a bit of an imposter when you sell your stuff? It's like who are who are you to do it kind of deal? Is that is that what that is that what that feeling is? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've, imposter syndrome. It's it's yeah, I, I definitely I definitely feel it. Um, I don't know. I think I'm just I'm just very agreeable, and I'm like worried about bothering people. <laughs> I think that, that okay. like that's literally that's literally it. Is like oh this I might, you know, I want to be sure this person's interested before I before I buy. I don't I like. It's not it's not rational. That's the you know the analytical no, no, part no, of no, me. I, the I, analytical I, I part of me is like why why are like it's entirely in your interest self to to convince someone to read your comic. <laughs> But okay, so I, I guess here's the deal, right? No one wants this. Hey, everybody! For two ninety nine, you can buy this thing right now. This this paperweight for two dollars and ninety nine cents. Yeah, it also occasionally plays music. But for two dollars and ninety nine cents, this could be yours. No one wants to hear a sales pitch. No one does, right? Um. Oh wow. Uh, we, I, I might have to touch on that because I, I, I got the, I, I didn't unsubscribe to that, and I guess I'm going to have to, I have to deal with it. I just got a mail from Warren Ellis, his orbital operations today. First one I've gotten in a long time. Is that the new? Is that the new image one? I saw a little thing on Twitter. No. About being so, like... so okay, so okay, very quickly, wrap, 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 wrap this point up. Number. Do you want to talk about Warren Ellis and everything that's happened to him, or do you want to go to Watchmen? 
It's up to you. Uh, I'm good. I'm good on talking about Warren Ellis. You, you, you Let's want, go you to Watchmen. Okay, good. Fair enough. We'll, 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 we'll ignore Warren. But yeah. Um, here, here, here's the thing, okay? Before we wrap this up. It's not... You're not being disingenuous, though. You worked your ass off on everything you've done. Right? You put the work in. Right? You, like, that, like... Instead of being a bother, it's like, it's okay to be proud of your work. It, it, I, I, it, even if it's not like, look, we all know this. We all have this in the back of our heads. There's all these little things. Like, okay, I, I just literally submitted to an anchor job. And I'm listening to all my podcasts. Oh, my God, look at the sound quality here. Oh, blah, blah, blah. I like, have that little bit of a meltdown. It's like, this isn't perfect. It's not about being perfect. It's about putting the work and effort in and following instructions first and foremost in my case but i put yeah. the work in right i put the work in i i, I this is my I've done almost 600 episodes of this right i if i didn't believe in what i was doing why am i here right when you're on a convention where like, like I, again i'm not saying you go up to the street hey have you heard about my book is the people who want to run away from you as far as possible but <laughs> and, and like like but they're at a convention because they like comics and they want yeah. to buy some comics yeah they, yeah, yeah i mean yeah. you might as well because oh okay so this is my favorite story when i was in phoenix okay i had a really cool i like when i was in phoenix, i did the phoenix con one year and i had a really cool seat there beside me there was a pretty famous art art, art artist he, he he was killing it they liked me because I didn't care how busy their stuff was. I, I basically asked them one request. They followed it all, all of the whole time I was there, and it was phenomenal. It was the fact that um, when you guys get busy, can you just make it so my stuff's visible? Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll move people over for you. That's that's all I'm asking. You, you, I don't care how busy you get. Just, you know, because that's your thing. They loved me. The guy beside me. Okay, so the, other, so the first day, it was two guys. Uh, they worked for the Phoenix Suns, which was really cool. So I got a chance to meet mm -hmm. them, get to talk to them. But the second the second day, they had their buddy in ours, and he had, like, a comic. And he just sat there and didn't talk to anybody. Like, nobody. And I'm, I'm looking at him. The guys beside me, the guys, the guys are looking at him. Even the guys in the Suns, they came and watched him for, like, a minute or two. It's like, this is killing me. I'm looking mm -hmm. at this, and it's just like, what are you doing? You, you, like this is like this is an eye with that. Jake the Snake Roberts is down is down the way there promoting a movie. You have to talk. At least talk to people, right? Because <laughs> yeah. you, you're just saying hi. That's all you're doing. Say hello. Make eye contact. Just just do it because again, people are here to look around and see what's there. They might say no. That's going to happen. You're in the rejection business. It's not necessarily on you. But yeah, he true. didn't do anything. Yeah. He had a good comic. He had a good comic. I looked at it. So I just looked at it. So I, I got to see. It's like, does it suck? No. Look. Shit. I don't like this. Because I, I didn't get it. I, I didn't understand. Right? Nor did their buddies. Like the guys, they lent them the table for the for that day because they had to cover a Suns game or, or were doing stuff with the Suns that day. So they let them have it. It's like they came back and they were like, "This is killing me to watch." It's like, yeah, like because he was talk. just he was just being so passive. Yeah, it just it killed me. Right? You're not again. You you did the work. I so you can't always control. You can't control necessarily the results of an event well how successful you're going to be your job is to do everything you can to succeed yeah right? Absolutely, man. Do it, right, yeah. right so if you don't talk if you're like i'm going to be a bother to somebody you are actively working against yourself to succeed right oh yeah i agree i don't i don't to be clear i don't listen to that to that voice yeah no yeah <laughs> but, but i'm just like I, I i feel this is like an important thing to say to creatives in general because as i i'm going ultimately this is how a creative can become a salesperson somewhat is recognize your enthusiasm for your work first and foremost second share that enthusiasm somehow some way that people can understand it Right. 
and then and then uh, and then from there, um, and then from there, just let it go. Let it. Let's see what happens. Let's let like live with the results. But man, at least put everything you've got into it. Yeah. Worry yeah, about. Well, I think, worry. I think that's. I think no. I think. I mean, something. Something. Here's something that that does that does really work for me is uh recognize just recognizing the process i i draw a lot of inspiration from stand-up comedians listening to stand-up comedians talk about the process of going on stage and dying when you're learning mm -hmm. um and and recognizing that that's that's it that's that's how you get good is by sucking and and you know you're trying to and I, I, I don't know. I like them because I feel like they're the sort of artist that is, it's all, it's, it's such a direct connection. You, it's you on a stage in front of people and you're trying to make them happy. Uh, and, and you have to, you have to read them. You have to learn how to, how to, you know, feel this, this group of strangers that you've chosen to thrust yourself in front of. And I, I find that super inspiring. It's like that's the game. Ultimately, that's the game we're all in. Maybe we're more introverted, and we would love to just make a comic and put it out there, and people like it. But you, you know, you the the second half of the artistic process is giving the thing to people and seeing if it affects them. And so, like embracing embracing that. Does this, you know, does this cover draw them in? Does my elevator pitch draw them in? Does the concept draw them in? That's all. That's all. Uh, of like, that's all gonna make your art better. So, so Doris, which one of your favorite talents, like just just being like openly vocal? Because yeah, I, I did I about you when we talked earlier this week. Doris, but, Doris knows how to sell herself. Yes, that's what nice. we're finding out. Yes. So, all right. So let 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 let's, let's get to the fun stuff. Let's let's get to like Watchmen because if we're gonna talk modern comics, that is the book to read. It is the it, I, you must start there. Without without yeah. Watchmen, everything that comes afterwards. Although you you will appreciate it, you won't appreciate the foundations of where it comes from until I read that book. So. So you're doing a story structure basis on Watchmen right now. What have you learned? Stand-up comic. Oh, ah, stand-up yes. comic. Well, that, I mean, if you're a stand-up comic, then uh, props, because that sounds scary. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, well, the whole project kind of started, the Watchmen project started as an outgrowth from um, my obsession with story structure. So, I'm, yeah, I don't, I you know, I don't know if it's a... Uh, it's just something I I like I like I like it when the world makes sense, and so I think that's part of why I'm so drawn to story structure because I I you know I guess I like formulas. I feel like I'm saying something uh, her, like <laughs> like heretical when I'm like I like a good formula for telling a story. No, <laughs> like that's not like 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 tr the truth of the matter is we all do like like there, some people will go oh i'm going against friends no you're not most people it that's not that's not how that works what what happens is like if you're going to subvert story structure you must understand how it works if you're going to play with the formula you gotta you, you you have to first know what the formula is yeah right yeah. It just it's just, it just how it works so I mean, Watchmen's like the ultimate form of that. Yeah. So, so I started this blog. Started writing about story structure. The mo my favorite model is Dan Harmon's Story Circle, um, and what I found so interesting is is because I studied creative writing. I took a I took a lot of I took a lot of literature and writing classes. Ultimately, majored in biology, but you know, studied writing a lot a lot. And English programs are bad at teaching story structure. They teach like Freytag's pyramid or whatever, the, the whole like, you know, they just draw a little bar graph, you know, a little graph, not a bar graph, a line graph. And it's, you know, it's a horizontal line and then there's a rising action and there's a climax and then there's a dis 
descending action and then there's an epilogue and it's like it tells you nothing uh it tells you nothing useful in my it's like stuff happens more intense stuff happens something really intense stuff happens and then the story ends and that's that's what you walk away with and it, it, you know, there's no, there's no connection to the characters. There's no, you know, yeah, there, it's, it's just, it's just dumb. <laughs> what, 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 what you're talking about is it explains how a plot works somewhat, somewhat, right? But plot does not mean anything with character at all. Like yeah, you, like, yeah exa like, exactly, exactly. Right? I mean, the thing about a plot, like, the thing about a plot is um, you need a plot, you need to figure out, okay, who are these people and, 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 and why are they in conflict? Plot's great for that. But plot doesn't answer the third most, and the most important question of them all, why should I care? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, I mean... You know, a, a go to a go to example for this stuff for me is John Wick, because it's mostly an action movie. It's mostly an excuse for Keanu Reeves to gun fu people for an hour and a half. But they 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 do the work at the beginning. They set up this character's motivations, and uh, you know, so you're you're excited to watch Keanu kill people for an hour and a half because he's he's getting revenge for his puppy and and uh yeah that's i don't know i just it blows my mind that that i don't i don't think we're good on uh, we're not good at teaching that maybe because uh academia doesn't probably value story the least right plot in particular the least right it's like like no you should have themes and and like you learn about like different have you, have you have you been taught about or like looked into like the different levels of reading like first level reading yeah, or, is or, reading or, or, for or, plot or, right what happens or, second or, level or, reading or, is is such and such third level reading is finding the deeper theme fourth level reading is is trying to figure out the the preconceptions of the of the author um and and they really in my experience step one was really skipped over so yeah, this was my this was what happened with me for me that that whole intro process was grade 11 because up to grade 10 english was basically for me book reports essentially but grade 11 um i had a very i had an excellent english teacher so for the first month he asked me great gatsby it was great gatsby i remember this and for the first month he let us do whatever, thought it was whatever. Then October 1st, he kicked everybody's ass in the class. Everybody's. Because what he did was like, okay, so did you guys see, you guys saw this, right? Right? Do you actually understand the imagery of the two women here on page eight? And the imagery, it's like, yeah, like talk about the flowing waves and stuff like that. It's like, uh, well, yeah, kind of. What does that mean? The whole class. No one got it. So he spent the next 15 minutes explaining that page. We went back to that page for like a month. Because mm. what he did, what he, what he did was what he wanted to show us was, um, what he wanted to show us is every book conveys a lot of levels to the book. Right. And he's, it was Gatsby. It was Macbeth, the love song of J. Edgar Prufrock. Those were my those were my three big reading things in grade eleven. It took me about a month of just being a sponge and soaking in, and I got it. I figured it out. Um, here's what I would say to you, though, and so as far as that goes, it's not that they're light on they're light on on um, they they don't value story. Academia doesn't value empathy. That's yeah, the, which part I, of I, which part of academia? Because I think I think there's a pretty big I think there's a pretty big schism in academia around no, empathy. No, no, no. I, I, I we're talking about story structure being the least valued, and you're asking me why. And the honest answer to that question is, it's a lack of empathy. 
because because in my this is just my this is my point of view on this is when it comes to critical thinking we don't we don't we don't teach critical thinking like we used to now this is, this is going to sound a little bit back in my day but I, like if, we, if we're talking like people coming up in terms of knowledge base i people 10 15 years younger than me have way more access to information than i ever did mm-hmm. tell them how to put it together and come up with different thoughts and feeling again and the reason being is that critical thinking process that i would like that not just in my english classes but my history classes my law classes all the social science extra social sciences stuff i took all that stuff was designed to make me question things to make me more empathetic to people around me to and while some of those lessons took years to sink and i got a thick head that takes <laughs> a little while in some cases right the thing about that was the tools were put in place that i could figure things out on my own story structure is a lot about figuring out it's not so much about plot as it is about character right that's what story structure is about well i so, think I, I mean to me it's the interface between the two yeah but I, but but i think i think like as i it took me a long time as a writer to figure this fully out because there's always that phase when you start writing that you're in your head all the time hey this is just a cool concept now i'm like i got a cool concept now what's the story i can tell with it what's mm -hmm. the story worth telling with it that's a huge critical step it's not taught per se right um but it is definitely something that that um that needs to be taught i don't know if it's undervalued per se i just think the lack of empathy creates creates that issue more so than the lack of there's a bunch of different story structures out there there's a lot of them i've seen the 12 step story circle i've seen i like i like right the 12 step that's that's like a more direct take on uh joseph campbell that's yeah, like a yeah. more direct interpretation of the hero's journey yeah. yeah yeah i've seen that i've seen a lot like again because because if you were like there are like lots of people have kind of defined their own formula and there's some things you can take from all of them that are really neat it, i just find i just find that for me like it's it's again ultimately for me it starts and ends with and then I, and this wasn't me three years ago right but it is me now is it starts and ends with your characters right um alice that poem i sent you mm -hmm. like i know her character arc i know what her actual character arc is throughout the whole process. I know what the story, for all the wonderful stuff I'm throwing in there, all the weird and wacky shit that's in there, I get her story. Like, I know where she is. I know what she's going to become. And everything else is just how she gets there, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm, of course, I'm having fun with it because I'm literally, I'm literally right now having a riddle contest between the cat, the Cheshire cat and the, and the Griffin from Alice in Wonderland and the Griffin's the role of the Sphinx from like, um, uh, Oedipus. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, so I'm having, I'm having some, I'm having some fun throwing in my Greek, my Greek tragedies with, with, with my Wonderland. It's been pretty fun to do, but, um, if it didn't serve the purpose of how can Alice and the cat and everybody else in the story, how can they grow? Mm hmm right because it doesn't do anything in that regard then i'm not doing anything like not really yeah yeah absolutely well i mean to to me uh there's to me there's something there like you can say you can say oh you can use this structure or you can use that structure but i think probably because i studied biology I think there's something biological in storytelling. I think there is there is some something something within us and things that we look for in a in a narrative as humans that are that are universal. That's why I mean that's the door Joseph Campbell was knocking on, and uh, and I th and I think that like you know we'll never get we'll never get a perfect model, 
uh, but but I but I think there is there's a structure that is that is the best way to help a human being connect to a narrative. Like I th I think there there's some you know there's it's it, it's something that we we will we can only approach, and I'm sure it's always going to be filtered through changing cultures, but. Mm -hmm. But like I think you know the I like I like known and unknown, and I think I I've, in terms of defining sections of a story, right? Uh, you know, and that's and that's this is this is Joseph Campbell stuff, right? He would he would use order and chaos probably that you know the hero starts in order, and then they cross the threshold into chaos, and they you know. He's got all this great terminology. They go through the belly of the whale and are digested. They have a meeting with the goddess, you know, they and and an atonement with the father. And yeah, like, you know, he's using all this real archetypal language. But I, to me, it boils down to I prefer known and unknown because it's. I feel like it's more uni, It's more universal, and I think that's how. That's how our brains categorize information. I think known and unknown are the like approaching the fundamental categories that are that we use for reality. So I'm gonna simplify it even further. I did an essay for Ben Bella Books called The Modern Day Percival, and I compared Aragon to Percival, the classic Percival from the classic romance. And one of the things I've noticed with every, like, and, and Joseph Campbell's characters, almost all of them are, like, the main characters are exclusively Percival's, right? They're almost all of them are. So I uh, looked at what they had in common. If you really sit there and think about it, the hero's journey is very much about where someone comes from and where are they going. If you want to really simplify it, cut all the, all the, the, the fat out. Spider-Man, Percival, family conflict. He let Uncle Ben. Sorry, die. you're gonna you're gonna have to educate me about Percival a bit because I'm not I'm not familiar. So Percival, with the... so Percival is a famous knight of the knight of the, knight of the round, but he's very innocent. And one day he cut. And one day, um, he finds the Holy Grail and he loses it. And in the process of doing so, hurts his family. In the in the process, his his father his father I believe it's been a while since I've read the story. So there, it, it. Oh yeah, that's the very Spider-Man. <laughs> it is very like, Spider-Man. I'm like, oh, oh that's Spider-Man. Spider -Man. <laughs> very Spider-Man, but it's also very. Again, that's very Spider-Man. It's also very Aragon. It's also very Harry Potter, right? It's very mm -hmm. Harry Potter. It's very. If you look at what the hero's journey is, it's family drama at its core. It's family drama. It's about not knowing where you come from. And figuring that out, right? Star Wars, Luke Skywalker is Percival. Mm -hmm. And the villain is his dad. Mm -hmm. Very, very much a family drama. Mm -hmm. Something you can connect to. Well, I mean, Joseph Campbell script doctored Star Wars, right? No, no, that, but absolutely. But I'm just I'm just saying like that's the that's the that's the thing though. If you look at the entire premise of the of that whole characteristic right Percival narrative which is the hero's journey narrative is ultimately about family that's why mm -hmm. that narrative works over and over and over again because it's something we all relate to we all have parents we all want to know where we come from it doesn't matter who we are it doesn't matter what culture we're in I mean it's one of the most human questions we have well right? I, and, I mean could could one make the argument as well that that your family is your first model, you know, your for your interactions with with everybody, right? Your parents are your first models of authority. They're the first people that teach you. They're kind of your first bosses. So the the fa you know, your the father becomes a person stand in for for your boss, right? You, you know, and and so like part of why why the family is the is is what's used in mythology is because it's it's resonant right you're well, it's relatable we all have one or even like like it's just we all do like it, no matter what it looks like 
Lou, okay, in, in, the, in the basis of Peter Parker, Luke Skywalker, no parents or foster parents. Peter's case is Uncle Ben's as much as dad as his actual dad is. His mm-hmm. parents are, like, Spider Man's parents are literally kept a mystery for most of his run because for him, like, one, it's not needed. You have Uncle Ben and you have Aunt May who are as much as mom and dad as anybody else. He doesn't need a traditional mom and dad, but they, every once in a while, they do tug on that heartstring because Peter wants to know where he comes from. Makes sense. It makes him a lot more relatable, a lot more human. And that unknown factor, right? That unknown factor with, with family, Aragon, same thing, right? Suddenly they did that. There's a certain innocence kind of with those characters as well. They're built to be by their very nature, Innocent, not sometimes ignorant, not necessarily in a negative way, but innocent. Like there's an innocence slash ignorance to them. That sometimes yeah, they, yeah, they haven't they haven't grappled with chaos or the unknown or whatever whatever no, whatever they, metaphor you want to use. Right? They're yeah, they're naive. Yeah, they've they, stated, they haven't gone through it. Yeah. Nor has it, but the reason that works too is nor has the reader. So now it's, there's an, there's an there's an easy parallel between the reader and that main character. The reason why Spider-Man, one of the reasons he's so endearing is because he has about as much idea of what's going on as you do, right? Whether, right, Doc Ock might be terrorizing the sea, but Spider-Man doesn't know why. What the hell is he doing this, right? You're asking the same question. Yeah, why the hell is he doing this? This makes no sense. And you go through this whole plot. Oh, and then you both have almost the same res- resonant re- re- resolution and resignation, right? That's why Spider-Man works. Spider-Man is essentially a Percival character. He accidentally, again, he's a response for great power comes great responsibility. He accidentally is responsible for Uncle Ben's death because he could have stopped what happened, but didn't. Because in that moment, he didn't realize it. Grant you, right? Grant you, who could have known that would have happened? But and does that is that guilt necessary? Maybe not. But I, I don't know. I, I think as a therapist, I might have a talk with Peter about that complex he's carrying. But <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a gravitas that people understand. I did nothing, and this happened because of me. Aragon did the same thing with his brother, right? Right. Both of his brothers, actually, right? Percival did the same thing, right? Except just to his folks. Family, right? Luke, look what he did to Vader. Right, right, at the very end, right? He hurt you, hurt the people. Like, like a lot of times, these characters do things to their families by accident, they don't mean to. What makes them so compelling, though, is even though they do fall, they get back up and keep going anyway. That's what makes them heroes. It's not necessarily the big D that they do, it's yeah, the pers- that perseverance can- is a is well, yeah, people who give up. They're not. They're not fun to tell stories about. <laughs> no, they're not. You won't respect that, right? Yeah. You, you used for people that fight on in spite of the odds. It's a big part of human nature too, right? So, if you look at, like, if you look at, so again, if you strictly look at the hero's journey, quote unquote, the best ones are family dramas because ultimately, what the hero is looking for is a place to belong, right? And to figure that out, they got to first figure out where they're coming from to figure out where they're going. And almost all of those stories tie into that in some way or another. Mm-hmm. And because of that, and, and because I did that essay, it ruins so many stories for me. I got to tell you, it's because, it's because I can figure out where they're going to go on some things pretty fast, right? So it's like... <sighs> You're like, uh oh, we got a Percival here. I, 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 again, it's one of the easiest archetypes to use. Like, epic fantasy is loaded with them, right? Because it's an easy one to go by and, and it, it works. Heck, most stories you watch on television, they use, like, we were talking about formulas, they use those formulas all the time, right? Once you see them, you can still have fun with them though. Like like the real like like honestly honestly the second part of that equation is expectations. You're playing with an audience's expectations. Like I said, there's a certain biology to a story. So the challenge you're making is are you making this stuff happen or are you subverting it? 
But going back to something we said earlier, you have to understand how these formulas work. In yeah, and, yeah and, and, and I mean, defy them, defy them with a, you know, with a graceful touch because, yeah. uh, the you know the amount of times that I've been disappointed after somebody defied my expectations, uh, to me is like further evidence that that certain aspects of structure are are important and are and are yeah biologically encoded let's say right where a story zigs when it should have zagged and and i go wow that was surprising i don't care anymore for some reason m night Shalomon's guilty of this one a lot yeah just getting twisty for the fun you know no, oh aren't you surprised did you didn't expect this and it's like no i didn't yeah, I, didn't. I didn't i didn't want it either well, no, no, it's like, you're right. I didn't, I didn't need to go this way. I mean, and, and that's like six Sense. it works. Six Sense. it totally works. Mm -hmm. That twist actually makes sense. It makes total sense, right? The little, there's a lot of little clues that are throughout there that kind of tell you that this is the way it's actually going. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Unbreakable. I thought he did a good job and, you know, it's, okay. it's in the superhero lane. Uh, yeah. Unbreakable is okay. I I'm so so on that one. Yeah, that, okay. I don't think it's. I mean, it was like that was was that his second film? Was yeah, Unbreakable second, second film. And it's like yeah. okay, this this guy's got his. This is his formula. He's going. Yeah. He's going to try to Sign, really Sign, surprise Sign, you at the end. Sign, Signs was the last one I thought that was actually was the last one he did that work at all. Right. Yeah, and even um, that one, it was like it all came together, and it's like okay, yeah, you know. I mean, the signs. The issue for me was like, why did the aliens come to Earth if they if water hurts them? It's not a good. It's not a good. I guess they were desperate. Was the idea, but I, that was that was I couldn't get past that sort of particular device. Like, oh, you've come to a planet that's seventy five percent covered in poison, and poison falls from the sky on a regular basis. G good luck. But I liked I the twist. It. I loved the idea. I loved like like to Shyamalan's credit. I loved the idea of uh, like a, a a man who's lost his faith getting it back from an alien invasion. Thought yeah, thought no, that it, was it, super it, cool. It's fun. It, it, it's a fun. It's a fun. It's a fun. Um, it's a fun take on that, right? And but yeah. the last one he really did that worked uh, at all, right? I, and then after that, it just he got subversive for the sake of being subversive like you can you can you can tell an audience what's going to happen and you can do it in very clever ways my favorite example of that is the matrix right i love the oracle neil scene is my is is me is one of those things where i just look at it and go you assholes you're brilliant but you assholes what are you waiting for the next life it's like oh it's just such a throwaway line Told us exactly what would happen, um, and it was like, ah, brilliant, worked. You make it too heavy-handed, though. You make it too heavy-handed. You make it too. Um, you can, like you said, you're like that's the heart of storytelling. Is it's you're playing with an audience's expectations. You need to understand formula to understand what those expectations are. And you can subvert it to anything you want, but one, you gotta have a real clear idea where you're going, and you gotta have a really smart way to get there, right? Maybe like, like um, me and you disagree with Last Jedi a lot, but I still think like the Snoke death scene was brilliant because it was yeah, perfectly yeah. unexpected. It was done in the right way. It played with the expectations of the audience perfectly and executed them in ways like, well, shit, what happens next? Now, and, and you're into it because you're like, okay, this, this, this was supposed to happen, but not here. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's, it's a, it's a strong midpoint. Yeah. It's a very strong midpoint. Um, yeah. Now there are other parts that, again, where he went and how he got there. Okay, that's maybe I've been as good. 
but the idea, but the idea, but you can subvert expectations and you can do it brilliantly. You just have to, again, you have to be aware of what those expectations are, right? Or you can go into expectations too. That works. Being predictable isn't always a bad thing mm -hmm. either. Well, the subverters help the traditionalists. Yeah. Right? The subverters mix it up so that people stop expecting the tropes and then you then you get to you get to lean on the tropes again a little bit. Yeah. They kind of, you know, the subverters renew renew everything. Mm -hmm. But but again, it's that balance, right? You gotta figure out you gotta figure out how like how to twist in a way that feels unique. Which ultimately I think is I think the the ultimate part of story structure that isn't talked about, like going back to something earlier, is you, your voice. Because again, every story has been done. It's really in how you tell that story. And the one thing that truly stands out is every voice is different. I cannot tell a story your way. It's impossible for me because I'm 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 not Leland. I'm not, I, I don't see the world the way Leland sees it. And I can't, I can't express it. Now I can take a formula from him, but I won't write it the exact same way because I just don't have your voice. And that's great. That means it's mm -hmm. for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, you know, and even, yeah, even if you have a formula, your, yeah, just through the benefit of being an individual, your interpretation of the formula is going to be mm -hmm. different. Yeah, yeah. Your your expression as formula is going to be different. Um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, like I said, I I think that like that I think that like I said, you can look at story structure. I think I think um, known and unknown. There is like making those decisions of what you tell the audience and what you sh like, what you show the audience and what you kind of reveal as time goes on. Right, that's but that's but that's not exactly what I mean by like like I could see why why you're taking it in 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 that angle, um, and it and and that's that's part of it. But um, when I was talking about it as like biological categorizations, it's like it's to do with with an individual's mental map right like like you know you have a territory you have you have explored territory and you have unexplored territory you have un um you know you have particular objects things foods that you've interacted with and things you haven't that's more what i mean by known and unknown and i think that that's a baseline that's the base categorization system because that's the, that's life or death Right. So if so, if I encounter a new kind of fruit, this weird purple berry, right? Is it is it good to eat or is it right? The berry is the unknown until I taste one and see if it kills me or or, or is nutritious. If I and like and I and I like that idea because I think of I think of human beings as explorers, right? And we're slightly cautious explorers. We've been shaped by evolution to, uh, you know, because we're we're learning creatures, engaging with the, you know, being curious and engaging with with the, with the strange is is built into us, right? We have yeah. we have a built-in toolkit for for engaging with the unknown and transforming it into the known. Mm -hmm. And so and so that's what I like about about any you know campbell or i like dan Harmon's story circle is my favorite because it's it's a much more distilled campbell um but so you know the circle works with the character starting in the known in familiar territory they have a need that pushes them out of the known into the unknown and then in the unknown they have to adapt and that's that's just that's you know to me that's like that's not a typical story that's every story every mm -hmm. story is about a, a character in an unfamiliar situation of some sort, right? It's whether it you, whether it's about a mermaid going on land, or you know Alice going through the Looking Glass, or someone what's that? Someone comes to town. Someone leaves town. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, like it's so you know, yeah. it maybe I th it's uh, to me it's like the most universal you can get, and still be useful. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so and I and I like I use it for everything. I think like it because it works for scenes too, right? A particular scene should be, you know, even if it's just having an un you know two characters having an uncomfortable conversation, that's the unknown, right? When you when you disagree. When you disagree with your friend, I my I feel a little flash of the unknown. Like, oh, I'm in I'm in slightly more I've entered slightly dangerous territory, right? And my friend and I have to navigate the unknown together to to transform it into the known. To and that's like I don't know. I just the unknown. Can we understand each other and still disagree? The known. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's, I mean, that's the unknown, right? And, that, and, that's, and that's the heart of all the disagreements, ultimately, right? Like, when we, when we, have, when we have argued about things offline about, about stuff, right? It's not, like, it's not like I don't see where you're coming from or you don't see where I'm coming from, but that's the point. It's not always about getting an agreement from somebody, right? It's about, okay, that's your point, cool. I might still disagree. You're like, well, I get your point. But I still disagree. Hey, cool. Want mm -hmm. a beer? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. Successfully, <laughs> successfully nav we successfully navigated that territory and yep. came out on the other side like, oh, I understand that. It's not dangerous. I don't need to be afraid of it. Yeah. Right? That's uh, yeah. Well, that, that that's it. Like, I don't and also like like but you have to embrace those changes and embrace those unknowns because honest to God, I, I would be very bored if the world saw everything my way. I mean, I'm right. I'm completely right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> but, but I but like it. I I get so nerdy about this stuff that I like. I find it inspirational because I think that, that that's what artists do. Artists go into the unknown. They mm -hmm. enter. They enter that chaos and they try to pull things apart and put them together in new ways that make sense. You know, an artist is tr is is going into the unknown and exploring it and and pulling something out of it and making it and, and, you know, building a new structure for it, for it and making it the known. Uh, and that's, I think that's what great art does. I think great art, does. even average art. <laughs> no, I, 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 well, what is average? I mean, that's, I mean, I, I think, I think a fair, a fair question there is what's great with what's, what's good. I think that those things are all relative. I think though, um, here's the thing. I, I have learned this with art and I've, when I've, read somebody or, or especially if I know them a little bit, I get a more of a sense of the person. When I get that sense of the person, I can look at the art and I can kind of see that person in the art. I think art, like the journey into that own, we, we, we are essentially conduits to whatever stories or pictures we paint or, or music we make. We're a conduit to it. But in that conduit, we find a piece of ourselves or, and give a piece. It's almost like a give and take. We give a piece of ourselves to that work or what we're doing. But in return, we get something new. It's almost like, it, like there's a growth. Like we take that little piece and then from that little piece grows a seed and we become something bigger. And the next time we go and do another story, we take another piece and kind of get back something bigger. And we discover a bigger, broader canvas of who we are as well. I think I think art is is, is much about telling stories, but it's also a big part about discovering who you are are in this weird journey of life and learning to understand not just you but how you see the world around you yeah well i i mean you know i'm i'm I, i'm always interested in the universality of this stuff like i'm I, I you know i think i think that that's that's one of the beautiful things about art is you you go deep inside yourself to mm -hmm. A really personal place and you dredge that out and it and then you get to marvel that other people feel that too that that by doing this really personal thing by digging into your mess inside of you and and pulling that out uh, other people connect with you through that because everybody else has the same stuff going on you know the same stuff mm -hmm. going on inside of them it's 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 what we all have in common like if we were really look around and look at people, we'd have far more in common than we're different. And honestly, our differences are very small. The differences are literally in the details, 
right? Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the wedges, a lot of the wedges are universal. The things that's where, you know, like tribalism, where people are pushing away some other group. It's like, and there, you know, two groups are pushing against each other. It's like the reason why you're pushing against each other is because you have a lot in common. You, you have mm -hmm. these same instincts to, you know, to pick a oh, team yeah. and, and push and, and, and do battle against another team. Yeah, and, and ironically, you're coming from the exact same place, and it, it's uh, it, it's hilarious to me on one hand, sad on the other too, a little bit too, because if you can see that, <laughs> because if you can see that, if you can see that they're essentially aren't doing the same thing you are, you'd think it would make it easier to at the very least stop and have a parlay. It's like, why are we fighting ourselves here? It's just yeah, I I. I heard a great, I can't remember who, who, who said it, but I heard a great breakdown. Like I'm not a sports guy. I don't really get sports. Um, I, and I heard an intellectual talking about going to a baseball game and seeing all these people really passionate about, you know, they're cheering like heck for their team and they're booing the other guys, but, but it's like, it's even, it's, it's the ballpark. They're in, you're in a park it's, and it's like this amazing uh, this amazing representation of civilization, you know, like sports that we've, we've successfully harnessed our tribal instincts into a silly game that everybody can go and, and channel that drive for their tribe to win into this proxy peaceful sport you know played on a lawn where people hit balls with a bat and I, I thought that was i thought that was brilliant like like oh yeah this is you know that's a great example of, of like successfully taking uh, a primal drive and and finding a finding a healthy way to express it through civilization right. uh I, I i do that at metal shows it's very primary to get rid of the primal drive out of you yeah not, not, nothing like screaming at a band you can't completely understand all the words to, but it, it sounds really cool and everybody's just bumping into each other and you just you're just having a go and and next thing you know next thing you know you go lift me up and a whole bunch of people are carrying you across. Yeah. I think the most, I, I think the most gnarly thing I ever did saw the metal show is um I actually got dinged. I got like like this rubber thing hits me in the head and I go ow. What the hell? Look up. Someone is in a wheelchair, literally getting crowd surfed all the way across. It's oh like, wow! Yeah, it's like yeah. I you, you're suddenly not so mad about getting dinged in the head by a wheel by a wheelchair. You don't get mad at that because the hell you don't see that, right? Yeah. And so you've seen someone getting crowd surfed on that. It's like it's a really really fun, fun like you know like experience. Like it's super fun. It's super cool, and you just enjoy that moment. It's great. Like it's so so great. And uh um but yeah, I mean like, like I said, in that pit, like we're all doing the same thing. We're fighting for our spot wherever that spot is. That's what we all have in common. Mm -hmm. so, oh, I love yeah. I love that about mosh pits. It's such a simple like because from mm -hmm. what I've heard, I'm not a metalhead. I've been in a couple mosh pits and they were very positive experiences for me. But from what I've heard, they're mostly like healthy like people know the rules and it's yeah like, like there's, there's, and, there's and it's, you, you know you know going in you're gonna get beaten up <laughs> you know you're gonna get beaten up a little bit but basically people push people shove people bump into each other and, and you just you just bang man and, and here's the thing if someone falls you help them up it's just fun. Yeah. It's like it's the right things you help them up um if they get if someone's getting a little bit too banged up you give them the space to walk away um you gotta watch out like i said there are the, i mean dirty shit does happen even in a pit uh, i i mentioned this earlier in the week doris was the guest and so she heard, heard this story someone actually hit give me a kidney shot turn around and i saw the guy and i looked at him so you do that again i i, I drop you right here i just drop you so and i i, I was so serious yeah, that he just, yeah i was serious and he knew it too it's just like he, he, he quietly backed away from me um but i mean it does happen like like women i i i i still feel bad i think i think the worst experience I, the thing i felt the most bad about um so i'm bumping i'm bumping all of a sudden i just go like this all of a sudden i'm like oh i touched some breast look around i'm so sorry she's like don't worry about it it's, 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 
gonna happen. It's like, okay, I'm glad you did not want to deck me right now because I kind of feel like <laughs> my fans are gonna ask. Right? It does like things things happen, but for the most part, for the most part, like like I said, where else can you go and get dinged in the head in a wheelchair and think it's pretty freaking cool? Like honestly, honest to God, it's like yeah. Any, anywhere else, I would not think it really cool to get dinged in the heel. He, he, so like I said, I got some. I must have some brain damage up here, probably somewhere, somehow, some way. But that's okay. It, it like like I said, but that's the like we. Again, we all are passionate. We, we all obsess over stuff. That's what makes us us. So I mean, th- the solution isn't to fight those obsessions and passions. It's to find constructive places where they they can happen. Whether that's a baseball game or a football game or metal pit or a wrestling ring or MMA cage or heck, even like, you know, most people don't even think like don't think of ballet and gymnastics as physical. No, th- th- those people are quite physical. Mm-hmm. They might be mm-hmm. the toughest, toughest people on the planet, actually. I yeah, ballet slippers are like medieval tor- torture devices. Now, it's not only that. Okay, think about this. Those, those, individuals can literally balance their whole body weight on their toes for minutes to hours at a time those are strong people you do mm-hmm. not mess with them right mm-hmm. <laughs> like they're they're strong people like 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 dance is surprisingly incredibly physical and you don't think it until you actually go through with it oh I, like, I think it every time i dance yeah <laughs> Now that you're older, it's like oh, I'm winded, to... winded and sore. And... It's like, why am I doing? It's like, oh yeah, it's so fun in the moment. Yeah. And you're like, I gotta get my, I gotta get my dead ass and stuff. Right. So. Dead, your dead ass and what? Well, your dead ass is in trouble. If I don't get my ass and shit, if I don't get my yeah. ass in shape, like I'm in trouble. So because I'm not gonna be able to do this stuff. And 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 like I said, I I. I'm still like, like I, I still feel like I'm in that middle age and crazy phase of my life. I still want to do all the things I did when I was younger, kind of. The only thing I'm not uh, big on anymore is, you know, the excessive drunk drunkenness. I can't do that. Really. Oh yeah, and, I was uh, middle, I was middle aged when I was 15 in in that along that axis. Yeah. Was ne- was well, never a, was never a partier. Yeah. No. Well, I I I I know how how to how to put this. I could party. But right, I wasn't really a party, but I could. Now, it's like if I do that, I'm like, I wake up. Oh, yes, body. I I'm an idiot. Please stop coming. <laughs> you're like, nope. It's gonna take to about three o'clock in the afternoon when you're feeling better. It's like, uh, okay, fine. I'm gonna cheat. Go find like the gnarliest cheeseburger I can find. Like I just need something like with a lot of grease. Bike, so so I can see the world properly again. Will you be hundred yeah. percent? Yeah. I want, no. has, has anybody researched the greasy the greasy post hangover breakfast? Like, what's the what's the science behind that? I know that alcohol is processed in the liver, and so is fat. Uh, the, so is that, that part of it? Is you're like you're it, like it, you're it, like it, cleaning it, out the alcohol? You you run some it, fat yeah, through yeah, there, it's, and it, it's the fat, and it's also believe it or not the salt. Salt's a cleaner. Most people don't realize how much, how powerful or cleaner salt is. Helps your body recover too in all kinds of neat ways, um, but it's, it's a combination of the fat soaking up a lot of the excess alcohol and and the salt is actually also doing a little bit of the clean on your system. It's like, <gasps> and also just giving yourself building blocks like protein and other things as well. And suddenly, and suddenly your body's like, hey, I'm doing something again, and I got a place to put all this excess crap you did to me last night. Uh, the best, uh, post hangover thing I think I saw was in Phoenix. There was a burger joint there that literally had the perfect balance of like, I'm I'm sober again. Like you, you, you like, you take a few bites of this breakfast. It's like, my feelings are all coming back to me. This is like, the <laughs> like they had a burger like that was just perfect for that. And, uh, a buddy of mine at, uh, the, one of the Hobbs brothers down there in, in Phoenix, like he literally came up with this. Like, yeah, I tried a lot of different things that this works. Cool dude. So nice. Yeah. yeah. But well, Mr. Mr. Leland, so comic wise, where like what's your next release? My next release is a book I am so friggin' excited about. It's uh it's called Capsules and it's a sci-fi story and it's about um it's about caregiver burnout. 
Uh, so my my wife has PTSD, and after she got, and we've been together for ten years since she got sick, and uh, our it was our things were very hard after she got sick. Um, PTSD takes a lot out of you. You get um, you get a condition called hyperacusis, um, where uh, you're basically as you know PTSD is kind of being in fight or fight or flight mode all the time. And so one of the expressions of that is hyperacusis, which is your ear canal actually dilates. So your, your, your hearing becomes more sensitive, I imagine, so you can hear predators sneaking up on you or whatever. So um, sensi sensitivity to sound, it's accompanied by depression, anxiety, you know, triggers. The, uh, for her, it was... Um, it, she worked at a hospital emergency room, so she had a lot of triggers associated with, uh, like, accidents that she saw a lot. So, like, motorcycles um, are still a trigger to this day. Um, but anyway, yeah, it's a story It's a story about, about taking care of somebody who's not well in space, because everything's better when it's in space. Um, so, yeah, it's about a couple in an escape pod, and... Uh, one of them's trying to hold everything together, keep the ship running, and the other one's unwell and is trying to do their best to be helpful when they can, when they're well enough, and the tension between the two of them um, in living in close quarters. That's hard. My uh, my grandfather in his last years of his life was suffering from, starting to suffer from dementia. And I, can, and I saw what the toll it took on my grandmother to take care of him. Right. It, I mean, it, most people don't realize it if they've never been in that situation, just how much energy it takes out of you to make sure you're there for someone else like that. I mean, you're willing to do it because you love them, but there are times you just you're done. You just don't have it in you. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's. You know, you know and it's I mean, it's an interesting one is the one who's okay i think a lot of a lot of people feel like well i have to give more like i'm the lucky one in this you know in this situation i'm the one who isn't sick so i have to, i have to give you know everything i can every day and uh you know the the wisdom of uh of airport information pamphlets you know put your mask on first like that that metaphor never goes away you have you have to be well to take care of somebody who's sick yeah otherwise otherwise you'll just get sicker and yeah. sicker yourself it, it, it can wear like you, you need you do need your you points in that so that's cool when's that coming well we got a page we got a page of uh and a cover to finish um probably a probably a probably two months so you gonna you gonna you gonna do the Indiegogo Kickstarter thing yourself, or are you gonna just you gonna just release them like you have been? No, I would like to kickstart this one. This this is you know we're talking about talking about ability to sell earlier. This is the one where I'm like I know exactly how to sell this. I think this story is important. I think I you know it's not a story I've seen, and no. um, and I think it's dark and funny and heartfelt. Yeah, I'm so, so excited to share it with people. And more importantly, it's a story you like. You feel you can tell well, like yourself. It's a story I'm yeah. a lot to hear. Right? Yeah, this is this is so, yeah, this is mine and mine and my wife's experience. Distilled so, into something with just enough just enough distance that it's like I can talk about it with relative ease. Yeah, just enough. It's like it's not me, so I can do this. Yeah. Um, right. So, but. My so a couple months Kickstarter. You want to come back on yeah. the show and talk, and when when the Kickstarter is going live and we can we can do some wonderful weird wacky shit on my pod and 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 and, and yeah and, yeah no that would okay. be great that'd be cool all right and so you're doing also so where are you on your Watchmen reading right now I'm almost done chapters seven and eight so I've finished one through six I'm doing two chapters at a time which I start I was like, I'll just bag it out three chapters at a time. Started reading, started going real deep, and was like, I just, I'm, I'll, I'll finish, I'll finish, uh, 
a post a month if I try to do three chapters at a time. So, so went to two already. Like I should have just done one. I should have just for the amount of time it's taken. I'm getting I'm getting one done about every two weeks. And it's like I my my schedule I'm trying for is a blog post a week. And it's like should have just done a chapter a week and done three yeah, three months. Yeah, that, would, that would have been twelve easy. That would have been twelve yeah. easy things. So now you got also on top of that. You got to figure out what else you got to talk about. Which you know. Which, considering how serious the gravity of the Watchmen is, I probably would just write about random weird stuff like penguin zombies and pong and whatever the other weird stuff I can do in the in the meantime. It's like, hey, here's some heavy, heavy lifting, and and in the in the middle, here, let's do let let's do plants versus zombies. <laughs> I like I yeah. like heavy though. Heavy's kind of where I live. Heavy's like, good. No, no, that's kind of that's kind of my bread and butter. Like I'm I'm. I'm happy to have serious conversations about depressing things all along. And like, I will, that makes me happy. <laughs> and, and that, it makes and me that feel like I'm deal, like I'm, you know, like, oh, I'm grappling with the world's yeah, problems. You, 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 I, I did something today. See, I, I, I'm perfectly content just to eat ice cream in the corner and go, you did that. Cause that's, that. All right, <laughs> but, um, not that it, I, I don't think the big serious conversations shouldn't happen. I also, do, but I also, I tend to think like a roller coaster, serious, silly, serious, silly. Yeah, that's, that's healthy. Different, different that's level. healthy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> serious all the time. I, I don't know. I, 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 then me and my liver would be probably be speaking to each other right now. <laughs> we have a very bad relationship and I, that's not a, it's not what I want. That's really cool that you're doing that. Um, uh, I guess last thing before we wrap up, then. Yeah, sounds uh, good. So reading, reading Watchmen this time. Um, you, like I said, we mentioned this earlier. Dave Kidman is severely underappreciated in this. But whose craftsmanship are you more impressed with, Alan Moore's or Gibbons? Now that you've gone into the deeper dives into the into the series. Um. Well, I'd be hesitant to uh, like assign credit. To, to either of them because you know mm -hmm. I, I imagine I could find Watchmen scripts online mm -hmm. potentially and it would be it would I, although I, I always find reading Alan Moore scripts to be exhausting because the amount of detail that goes into every panel is is incredible um, so so but like in terms of I mean in terms of the art Gibbons is just doing just classic flawless comics uh for the most part uh, you know like like just exemplifying the best of what 80s comic art looks like um you know yeah i i i'm scared i'm i'm honestly i'm scared to you know i know i know more is brilliant i've i've read his work with other artists and and there's some there's clearly something he brings that i see in every book um I, I suspect, I think part of what, you know, this is, this is totally conjecture, but I do think Gibbons brought something and ability to focus more and maybe rein him in a little bit that I don't think I've seen in a lot of the other stuff that Moore's done with other artists. Like Watchmen is so, so distilled um and i and i i just credit more with that because i see less of it in or sorry not more i credit gibbons with that because i see less of it in moore's other work mm -hmm. um that's yeah that's that's what I, that's that would be my my final word on that one because i i mean mostly i just look at it and go this is just a team firing on all on all cylinders and oh, it is. Oh, it's, i just want to give i just want to throw confetti over everybody so, so then I want to say this. Besides Watchmen, what's your favorite Alan Moore project? Swamp Thing, his Swamp Thing run. I I love it to bits. Promethea, J. Him and J. Oh yeah, I haven't see. I haven't read Promethea, so that one's really fun. That one. All right. It, it's shorter than it should have been a little bit, but it's super fun. It's super super fun. Like right, next time we come on, we'll talk. We'll, we'll make this a little bit more comic centric. I think, or maybe we'll, or maybe we'll do an epic Star Wars like thing about why the last jedi oh man i'll like, rip them all apart it sounds great yes yes i'll rip them all apart some of them i'll rip with you like the first trilogy i will rip it all apart with you second trilogy o not, not. og oh are you going chronologically like 
chronological. Chrono chronological. Chronological. O o OG trilogy is really good, by and large. It's oh yeah. So you're talking prequels. Right. You'll rip. You'll rip the prequels with me. Oh, totally. Like yeah. absolutely. Right, because the, the prequels aren't are no matter what anyone wants to say, even though the third one is watchable, it's not good. Right, um, right, it, it's not good. Whereas um, the second trilogy or the OG trilogy is by and large really good, although the third movie does have its flaws. Um, and the last trilogy, I like the first movie. I like the second movie. I actually, the first time I saw it, I hated it. But upon reflection, I think it's actually quite brilliant. The third movie is at best okay. I still think the third movie of the third of the new trilogy is still better than the chronological one, two, and three. It's better than all of them. But yeah, I I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, I think that I think that's easily the worst Star Wars movie. I think no, I no. think you I really? think. Yeah, the ninth, I whatever. I don't even remember its name. I think it's the worst Star Wars movie. Oh, it's, like, it's, 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 uh, the, bottom no, of the barrel for me. For, for me, it's Attack of the Clones. Easily, Attack of the Clones is worse than that one. Right? That that's just me. I I, I I as much of a hot mess as that first hour is. I if I ever hear the dialogue between uh, uh, Padme and 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 uh, yeah, it's it's sorry, terrible. Yeah. It's terrible. It's it's it's. Uh, it hurts. It hurts every I mean, time. It's, it's, it's not it's even given, like, it's like giving us some quality memes at least, or something to that effect. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll do that next time. But for this time, I think we, cool. we've got a pretty good episode here. So plug your like. So when your comics coming out in two months, then that's plan? yeah, that's a safe timeline. I'm um, okay. So my, my artist Casey you? is brilliant, but has a lot of projects on the go. So we're. I'll get no, no I'll get the art when I get the art and it'll be and then it'll get lettered so, and by me and then it'll be done. So for now then how can people just find you? Uh check out my blog on upstartcomics.com. That's that's from there you can find all my stuff. Upstartcomics.com. Upstartcomics.com. I'm part of a comic collective that I helped found here in the Okanagan and uh Yeah, all right. You'll find all my work on there and and me nerding out about story structure. That's right. And then and like what we did here. Anyways, guys, yeah. that is tonight's episode of Just Josh. I got one more tomorrow. I got Lola Grant coming on tomorrow, which is going to be a really, really fun way to wrap up the week. Got a really cool week next week. I'll announce that tomorrow. Um, but guys, until then, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Stay inspired. Keep shining in the dark. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. Right on. Thanks, Josh.